Okay, I think we're ready to go. Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Arnold, Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thanks for joining us today for our final and 11th webinar as part of the Fall SRS webinar series. Related, if you haven't already, I do encourage everyone to visit the fall.srs-webinars.com website to re review the previous talks of this series as well as the prior series. And through this website, you can register to view recordings of the prior webinars as well. And one final item of business before we get started, if you would like to submit any typewritten questions at any point during today's talk, you can do so by using the Q&A button found at the bottom of your Zoom console. And time permitting, your questions will be addressed at the end of today's talk. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical, inventor of the CyberKnife robotic radio surgery system, and professor emeritus of neurosurgery and radiation oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Adler. Good morning to uh, this morning's webinar, this, or this evening's webinar, where you are, where you are in the world. So I'm delighted to present uh, today's uh, two speakers. Um, one of which needs absolutely no introduction among the, um, the world of radio surgery. Uh, the second who is less known, but is actually her work is very well known because. Um, but anyway, the first speaker is uh, Doug Konzioka. Doug is uh, clearly a towering figure, not only in radio surgery, but throughout all of uh, neurosurgery. I think he is been singly responsible for a range of different leadership positions from the CNS to AANS, almost all the radiosurgical circles, the, the Journal of Neurosurgery. Um, he, most importantly though, in my mind and with relevance today, he has been one of the giants of radiosurgery over the last generation and uh, has really been one of the handful of people uh, responsible for making radio surgery uh, what it is today. And so um, Doug is he's filled with great ideas and cool observations. And uh, I'm delighted that he can join us this morning and talk to us about uh, the cost effectiveness of stereotactic radio surgery relative to open surgery. So without further ado, uh, good morning, Doug, and uh, thank you. Thank you, John, and thank uh... Thank you to uh, Mark Arnold uh, for helping to put together the entire seminar series. I remember logging on to hear um, Dr. Shoulder lead off one of the first discussions uh, back in the spring uh, when we were all thirsting for uh, the radio surgery community and interaction. And I remember I was, I think I probably had COVID while I was listening to it uh, in my office that day, in my home, I mean. and. Um, I'm really supportive of the whole program and uh, congratulations to you for putting together a wonderful array of topics. Um, this topic is a difficult one and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Linda has to say uh, after I speak. I, I certainly wish that uh, more had been written, more had been done in this area of research. It's difficult as we'll talk about and um, give you a sense of, of what has been done and what needs to be done on the topic. So the term cost effectiveness gets thrown a lot, uh, thrown around a lot, and you can break it into the cost of something, uh, and then the, of course, the effectiveness of doing something, and it's that duality. We're pretty good at measuring the effectiveness of things. We're not very good at understanding the cost of things for a number of reasons that I'll talk about. But when it comes to um, radiosurgical uh, studies and comparisons to other approaches, you know, we have to look at these you know, multiple elements. One is the cost of doing nothing, uh, which can include imaging, um, and of course, allowing a tumor to grow for potentially and letting the tumor cause its own problems. What's the cost of doing that? And uh, are things more expensive to deal with later if a tumor is larger? I'll show you a little bit of information on that. Um, the cost of, of surgical resection, which can vary um, from institution to institution and from country to country, of course, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, and then it's um, computers, fractionated radiation therapy, which could be less expensive, such as conventional RT, or more expensive, such as IMRT, and of course, the very expensive um, proton-based radiation therapy, for which not a lot of effectiveness is actually known. 
Now, one of, the, one of the issues here is that we would love to get the cost side of the equation, but most hospitals or institutions you work with or I've worked at uh, are not willing to share that proprietary cost data with you. And so we go to surrogate information, which has typically been charges. Now, charges is not cost. A hospital or a physician can charge whatever you want um, and hope you get paid. And in certain you know, countries of the world, these numbers can vary widely. What we actually want to know, though, is cost, not, not the profit line that might be associated with charges. And so cost data is hard to get. The other problem with, with this kind of research is that because a study from, let's say, uh, India gets uh, uh, put together, its relevance to, let's say, practice in Sweden may not be a very strong message, or a study from China may not be that relevant in the United States. So the elements of, the, of, of, the, of any kind of research in this area are important, but sometimes the message is less uh, relevant to different institutions. We, we became interested in this at the University of Pittsburgh about 25 years ago, uh, working with uh, Mike Rotigliano, who became one of the very first people to get involved in this. Mike was one of our residents who, as part of his two years of uh, neurosurgery research, went and did an MBA and studied cost effectiveness. And so Mike became one of the early leaders in this field, including working with some people in healthcare economics. You can see uh, Martha Green listed as a, and Vic uh, Khanna as uh, co-authors. And a second study, which was quite similar, was put together by Manesh Mehta and Tim Kinsella from uh, University of Wisconsin. And a few years later, another study from Taiwan. And they eventually, they essentially show the same things that amongst the array of radio surgery, whole brain or resection, that radio surgery was the most cost-effective approach for patients with brain metastasis. This is, this is essentially work done in the 90s, uh, early 2000s. The questions continued with additional studies uh, here in 2012 and then in 2014. Um, again, looking at radio surgery with this uh, question, does it make sense to add whole brain radiation on top of radio surgery, or should you just do radio surgery alone? Of course, there were many studies that were not cost effectiveness studies that were being done just at the at clinical outcomes. And as we all know, and as we practice now, whole brain radiation therapy is rarely given if you're doing radio surgery. It's 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 almost an after. It, but you know, 20 years ago, that was not the norm. Many patients would get concomitant uh, treatment, whole brain plus a boost or uh, you know, they get whole brain at another institution, then come to your place and you wouldn't be thrilled with the whole brain, so you might give radio surgery. But all of these studies showed that radio surgery alone uh, was, was most cost effective. So from, you know, to summarize, it was essentially 20 years of work in, in, in the era of, let, let's call them low numbers of brain metastasis. What we found was that Radiotherapy, let's call it large field or whole brain radiation, was low cost but lower effectiveness, often not durable, and the functional cost was high as patients live longer in terms of their lack of independence, their need for uh, social support systems, cognitive issues, and so on. Resection was the most expensive but was highly effective, highly effective at allowing people to live longer, and of course we all know that as patients are living longer in an era of now better systemic therapies, we're actually using resection more than we used to use it as patients live longer. And radio surgery does remain highly cost effective, but the cost for maintaining functional independence has not been well studied. So we're still looking at simple things like survival, but we're not looking at, for example, uh, when whole brain radiation or other types of approaches lead to you know, cognitive issues, memory issues, more dependence, what is the cost of that versus uh, radio surgery, which typically maintains cognition, doesn't cause leukoencephalopathy, and the clinical sequelae of that. So just a couple of slides, and we all know about extended survivals, but I want to show you this data. This is from our own prospective registry, of which we have a, a, an analytic platform, so we can look at this all you know, any day we want. And on the left, we have different filters uh, so I've chosen lung cancer versus melanoma, and you can see that median survivals are now, you know, with all types of lung cancer, 20 months in melanoma, almost at the same at 20 months. Whereas you go back before 2010, uh, virtually any melanoma study had a median survival of between five and seven months. So cost effectiveness means more now uh, 
uh, than it did. And it means different things then. Be previously, all the studies were looking at was it worth it to pay a certain amount of money to live a short period of time? Essentially, it was palliative care cost effectiveness, whereas now we're looking at extended survival uh, cost effectiveness. And to show you even subtypes of lung cancer from our registry, EGFR positive lung cancer, again, with the targeted therapy options, median survival is 30 months, and an ALK positive lung cancer, less common, we haven't even reached median survivals um, in, in this group. So cost effectiveness, very important. The next question then goes to the issue of more tumors. Um, and as more and more tumors were treated with different radiosurgery platforms, here's up to 10 tumors studied four years ago from Yale. Again, what was found in this conclusion in the center of the slide, the most cost effective strategy for up to 10 METs is radiosurgery alone in comparison to combined approaches. And this was, correlated with additional studies in 2014 and, and uh, 2017 uh, from Phoenix and uh, from Illinois looking at that same question. Now I show you this data from the University of Virginia and I'm going to show you again that, and I'm going to show you the same slide in a, in a couple of minutes uh, again, but this is looking at brain metastasis, vestibular schwannomas, and AVMs for section costs versus radiosurgery costs. Now this is not effectiveness. This is just one element of the equation. And of course, radiosurgery costs are lower. And, and in this uh, study from um, uh, UVA, you can see they're about 50 to 60% lower than uh, resection. And this is cost not just of the procedure, but with um, uh, management costs, uh, complication costs, and some early follow-up costs. So we, 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 we know that. Now, now let's do a deeper dive for a few minutes into uh, the topic of vestibular schwannomas and show you how we did a cost effectiveness study. And this was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery uh, last year. So the first question we wanted to know was that if you really understood costs, if you could really do this and do it well, and I hope Linda is gonna tell us how to do it well and be critical of this paper. One question was, would it affect how you choose or perform patient care? Like, do you really, does this matter to you? And if you were the patient and you had a choice of different care options, would cost matter to you? So you could look at this from, from different perspectives. Obviously, everybody wants to do what's best for their patients. But if you had two things that were equal, would, would cost be a driver or would you, or would you still choose another uh, concept? Like, I don't want my brain opened uh, if you just didn't want surgery, for example. So we've, we've, our literature is full of comparison studies between different options for patients with vestibular schwannomas. So if you had a vestibular schwannoma yourself, let's look at the data. So our methods were, we asked, we asked NYU for actual cost data um, and they provided it to us. Now they would not allow it to be published. So we, we compared this to uh, Medicare charge information. And I'll tell you right now that were, they were within 10,000, I'm sorry, 10% 10 of each other. So. We, what we actually have the, the cost data, including practice, uh, follow-up, and um, out-of-system encounters, which we, which we correlated. This is difficult to work. There was a 67,000 cost line items to compare 230, 203 resection cases and 114 uh, radiosurgery cases. And we did a matched analysis. So they were matched based on tumor size. And then we focused on 88 patients from each intervention group. In fact, this was a a subset analysis of our separate paper on match cohort uh, propensity care matching for resection versus radiosurgery, surgery. But in this element, we looked at cost. And the average size was 1.3 uh, centimeters. Now the cost components were the index costs, which is essentially the, man the initial management costs, and then the follow-up costs out to three years. And that became total cost. So uh, reimbursements, as I, as I said, were within 10% of actual hospital costs, which we had. And you can see that the radiosurgery cost here was about $10,500, and resection costs were $27,000. And you can see there's variability of the costs of resection, of course, depending on a number of things, including whether they got a complication, CSF leak, uh, you know, hemorrhage, infection, whatever. But you can see that the radiosurgery costs are extremely uh, consistent and predictable. And of course, at all our institutions, they're essentially the same thing. They're the nursing care, there's the outpatient admission, there's the IV, there's the gadolinium, there's the MRI, and that's about it. And the, and the physician costs, it's very reliable. 
Now I'm going to go back to this UVA slide I showed you earlier, where I'm showing you in the middle vestibular schwannomas, where resections were 67,000 and radiosurgery was 37. Now, how do you have this cost here at UVA and at NYU? It's 10,000. And I can tell you, New York is a much more expensive place to practice, I would imagine, than Charlottesville, Virginia. It's because this. This is not really cost data. This is charge-based data, and it also includes costs uh, over a, a, a large period, of, a, a longer period of time. So let's look at the follow-up costs and uh, try to even this out. So for microsurgery, you can see that, of course, we have our index costs, which are highest in that first few months, and then we have the cost of doing other things, which includes follow-up and CSF leaks and some attempts at hearing augmentation. You can see one spike because of meningitis. And you can see that within the first four months, the main drivers of excess costs include CSF leak, venous sinus thrombosis, hydrocephalus, and, re and rehab. Whereas on the radiosurgery side, the index costs, as I mentioned, are very consistent. And then later costs include the odd patient who has hydrocephalus needs a shunt, here was somebody who had uh, multiple trips to the ER because of disequilibrium problems. And here's at the end uh, a radiosurgical failure that led to a resection. And of course, then we have to include the costs uh, of resection. You can see that for the follow-up costs, uh, there was no difference between three to 36 months radiosurgery versus resection. And Initially, this, was, this is against what some people had thought 20 years ago, where they said, oh, the cost of radiosurgery is higher long term because of all the scans you people are doing. But you can see the slope of these curves are identical, that radiosurgery and resection continuing, uh, continuing cost after the, incident, after the uh, incident costs are the same. Now, I want to show you this. This is the impact of tumor size on, on, on cost. And... Um, Again, it doesn't matter at the bottom how big a tumor is for radiosurgery, the cost is the same. However, the cost of resection goes up in a predictable fashion with tumor size, and it increased by $12,000 for every increase in maximum uh, diameter by a centimeter of the tumor. And why was this? Well, larger tumors were associated with a more difficult uh, post-operative course and a higher incidence of uh, CSF leak. Essentially, what this shows is that if you want to reduce the cost of resection, you have to lower the cost of CSF leaks. That's, that's essentially what this cost-effectiveness analysis showed. If you want to play with radiosurgery, you better have almost a zero CSF leak rate. The limitations of this, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's derived from a single institution. It studies, um, we had to put a time limit on it, which was three years. And we, again, we're not looking at indirect costs, including lost wages, attributed to uh, recovery time or disability. So from this study, cost is not the whole story. An individual patient may require more expensive and necessary care for their larger tumor that may not be suitable for radiosurgery. Um, but for patients matched by tumor size, both initial and follow-up costs were significantly higher for the resection group. And to lower the cost of resection, focus on reducing CSF leaks. As there's no doubt that worldwide access to radiosurgery is crucial. And one of uh, Dr. Adler's uh, visions for the ZAP system was a lower cost device to provide improved access to this technology. And not just access to the device, but access to the continuing um, use of it in comparison to other options. So cost and cost effectiveness remain uh, critically important, but at the same time remain um, an area of research that um, is, is underappreciated and underperformed. Uh, and I'll stop there and thank you for uh, your attention. Great, right, Doug. Um, thank you. And uh, we're going to hold questions, I think, till the end. Um, uh, next up is uh, Linda Winger. Um, Linda Winger is a longtime um, um, senior leader at uh, George Hankel Center, now MedStar. Um, she has been uh, intimately involved in a lot of the reimbursement issues around radio for a couple of decades and probably is one of the unknown, unsung heroes uh, in the American radiosurgical community because she's responsible for getting the robotic radiosurgery code, which has made uh, many radiosurgical programs financially viable and some, in fact, uh, quite well. Um, and uh, so Linda is uh, always on the cutting edge of, of reimbursement issues uh, being in Washington, D.C., 
at least American reimbursement issues. And that's a question in itself. Some of our audience may have some perspectives outside the United States. In fact, be shocked at some bills and payments that we garner here in this country. But uh, without further ado, uh, Linda. Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to say it's nice to hear a neurosurgeon talk about charges and costs because there is a huge difference. And certainly anybody can have a charge, but everything's based on cost. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Okay. Linda, would you like me to advance the slides or should I allow you to uh, share? You can, you can go ahead and do it. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Right. You're, you're ready to go. All right. Thank you. In my presentation, I'm going to discuss the uh, recognition of SRS within the radiation oncology field and its payment structure. Okay, Mark, you can go to the next one. In an, in an earlier presentation this year, Dr. Adler summarized the 35 year history of SRS delivery when COBOL 26 um, was, or 20, COBOL 60 was the gold standard. That changed when Dr. Adler introduced us to the CyberKnife robotic system. And now 20 years later, he's introduced us to ZAP Surgical, once again, changing that delivery model. The economics of SRS are changing. The history of SRS codes and payment development are important for us to understand to see where we are today. CyberKnife was a major disruptor in the market. Fractionated treatment was not accepted or recognized by Astro. Astro denied publication of physicians' work with SRS in the Red Journal. Today, we have Curious, as, and it's essential as an open forum for research, but we did not have it during the beginning of the CyberKnife era. And in the year 2000, there were no separate reimbursement codes for SRS. Okay, next slide, thanks. So how do we get codes and payment rates? There really is no formal process. CyberKnife users met with CMS and MedPAC to get support for new codes and help them understand SRS fractionated treatment. We were met with opposition from Astro and without their support, we were told we would not get codes. Well, I work in Washington and I did have an opportunity to sit down with Tom Scully, the CMS administrator at that time, and I discussed the problem. He agreed to give us SRS temporary codes to allow us time to work with CMS to determine appropriate reimbursement. And that's at the time when the GO339 and GO340 code were introduced and assigned to SRS. Those codes are still in use today with a few others that have been added. Next slide, thanks. Okay. In, in 2001, CMS admitted that they didn't know what SRS was or how to price it, but they priced it anyway. And it was priced low in relation to other modalities, citing no literature or studies published to support SRS use. And no one knows where they came up with the five treatments as the maximum billable treatments. Next slide. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Uh, in November 2003, CMS finally agreed that SRS needed separate codes and admitted their reimbursement methodology was flawed. CMS did not fix the reimbursement, but they did make the G codes permanent. I'm often asked, including from Dr. Adler, why aren't freestanding centers paid the same as hospitals for providing the same services? Well, here's why. Freestanding centers and hospitals are paid from two different fee schedules for the same treatment. And they're actually under two separate um, ones, as, led us to different legislative areas of the law for reimbursement. The physician fee schedule is used for freestanding centers and the prospective payment system is for hospitals. And hospitals under that system receive a higher payment for the same service. Next slide. Thanks. Okay. CyberKnife member centers, um, like you heard earlier, we submitted, we compiled our cost data for treatment of five different types of cancers using SRS. There were 12 centers, and we submitted the data to the same company CMS uses to collect information on the cost of care. We included all direct costs, including CyberKnife, market costs, labor costs, and other costs that would be appropriate for that review of, and to help CMS reimburse rates for SRS. 
CMS refused to reviews, review the data without support of Astro. Next slide, please. The, the following year, CMS announced that its data analysis of the 2000-2005 claims revealed stable median costs for SRS payment claims. And the APC committee agreed that the claims and cost data we submitted the year before correctly re represented the direct cost of treatment. N next slide, please. So today, the population health and policy initiatives are setting the stage for real disruption of the traditional payment for services. CMS is now mandated by Congress to review payment methodologies and develop new payment models. In preparation for developing a radiation oncology model, CMS conducted an analysis of radiation therapy claims and payments. CMS finally recognized shorter treatments of treatment are effective and reduce costs. And over the last two years, CMS has been working on a radiation treatment payment model to address many of the inequalities we've been pointing out over the last 19 years. CMS conducted an analysis of the 2016-2018 claims data, and they noted that IMRT had been historically associated with higher payments and more treatments per case. Their analysis included adjustments for case mix, diagnosis, and geographic adjustment, and still the case payment was considerably higher. They also noted that the data showed that shorter courses of radiation therapy are equally effective and could improve the patient experience and reduce costs, meeting many of the CMS's objectives under the model. Next slide. So over the last 20 years, we've heard CMS voice their objectives to develop a payment methodology that rewarded quality and a payment system that did not favor the use of one procedure or system used to achieve the outcome. They've been saying the same thing since 2001, but now they've developed a radiation model that doesn't incorporate those qualities. Next slide. The model test period begins July 2021 and ends in December 31, 2025. The model will provide separate, separate billing code for use for those participating in the model to enable them to do a pure analysis of the data. The model only applies to patients with traditional Medicare coverage. They want to keep any of the, they want to keep the data set pure for analysis without discounted advantage plans, premiums, and claim, payments, claimants being, being included. The payment model is designed to determine if episode-based payments reduce costs and maintain the quality of care. The model finally provides for a site-neutral, modality-neutral fee schedule that will equalize payment, importantly, from the same, for the same service provided at any site. Next slide. For 20 years, we've worked with CMS and private insurers to recognize the value of SRS Look, that provides lower costs, improved patient experience, and quality outcomes. In the publication of the final radiation oncology model, CMS specifically referenced credible 14 published journal articles in support of SRS, recognizing shorter courses of radiation therapy are equally effective and potentially reduce cost. This is the first time we've been publicly in a legal document, Federal Register been acknowledged as being credible and have clinical evidence. This was very important. And my last slide. Thank you, Mark. So today we're looking forward to the recognition that payment for radiation therapy will be site neutral, paid under the same fee schedule, and the payment is not based on a specific modality. And SRS fractionated treatment is recognized as efficient. And that's important because it's a term used by CMS to indicate a provider who is choosing a treatment based on potential outcome, not to receive a higher payment. So it's been 20 years since CyberKnife came, came on the market. 
and a lot of work has been done, but we'll continue through the radiation model as it evolves to make sure that the payment rate equals the work being done by all of you out there on the clinical side. And that's where we are today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, there is a fascinating story. It's many of the sordid details you spared us, but it's many of which I happen to know over the years where you can see all the political backstabbing that went in, that, I'm sorry, that went into um, deciding how these codes were built and, and how they were kind of framed. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it's, it's almost, a, it's an, truly an embarrassing indictment of the American uh, healthcare and political system. Uh, but uh, was a fantastic overview. So if any of the audience has questions, uh, please pipe. I'm going to start by asking a few myself. So uh, Linda, you basically have presented that um, the radiotherapy versus radiosurgery argument, uh, while Doug, you've really much presented the surgery versus radiosurgery argument. And I think there's validity to both. Um, I would hope that what we're going to find is in the new healthcare system that's emerging, that we have a, uh, a holistic approach that there isn't multiple different um, websites or multiple different tools that compare each in isolation, that they compare it in, 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 in unity. And so specifically next year, uh, I thought we we're supposed to start seeing this uh, transparency in, in cost. So the federal government is going to mandate hospitals, at least, have to publish the cost of different procedures. Um, how do you see that, Linda, how do you see that, Doug, impacting what we pay for radio, what, what is paid for radio surgery going forward? Doug, you want to start that? I mean, it's kind of, if that's in your domain, can you answer, please? Yeah, I think, John, that's, you know, it's, it's unclear what will happen at, in, in many levels when that information comes out. I mean, the, the transparency issues uh, across, you know, people looking at MRI reports, clinic reports, and, and billing records is going to be very provocative. And uh, I think, you know, for example, one question right now in the world of brain metastasis is what to do with these very small tumors where the medical oncologists may be managing them medically and uh, and then you know we, we get a phone call six months down the road when there's a new larger tumor or uh, you know it didn't work and maybe at that point the person has a seizure and requires an admission to the hospital whereas you know if we had treated them earlier and stopped the tumor before it grew they would have avoided that admission so I think we're going to be challenged to do a much deeper dive into practice uh, cost effectiveness not just you know comparing treatment x to treatment y but you know but management management costs like for example we've done a we've done a study that has been very hard to publish it's it still is not published but but we looked at we looked at every um everything that happens to a patient with lung cancer once they get a brain metastasis every chemotherapy infusion every admission every drug every infection every DVT, every palliative care consult. And it's been difficult. So example, what's, so then what is the, what happens to a patient? And now we'll, now we'll have a better sense of what's the cost of all this. So I think we just need to be prepared that we're going to have some big work ahead of us. And we may not like some of the conclusions uh, that, that comes from this. And we're, we're going to be challenged again to kind of get our ducks in a row and approach this. And it's going to be interesting. Doug, I have a journal for you, uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, Linda, um, how is <clears throat> um, cost transparency or pricing <clears throat> transparency that's supposed to be introduced next year going to impact the debate between radiotherapy and radiosurgery? Uh, but well, not. well, I think it will. When I read through the Federal Register's many pages of this radiation oncology model, they've got a pretty sharp team. The sem CMMI is the Innovation Center for CMS, and they recognize that there are, are all kinds of different ways to look at cost. We look at direct cost when we submitted our data in 2005, mm -hmm. and yet 
cost to many people means an inclusion of other things. So, but, but CMS developed a, a, a method of sort of clearing that when they looked at IMRT costs being, after they, they adjusted for geographics and for other you know, items. So we're looking at, they're going to work through this data that they're putting together and they're gonna look for some pure data elements, some kind of formula or some things that they see that are transparent enough that they can start seeing what the actual elements are. Our problem is going to be working with them as they, they try to put a price tag on a reimbursement on this to make sure that that reimbursement does cover our costs. And we're going to have to be transparent in helping them see that cost or else we're not going to get reimbursed for what we want, what we're doing. So that's going to be the dichotomy. We're going to have two sides of this. We definitely are going to have to work on that reimbursement. Doug, I'd actually like to answer a question that you posed earlier or a scenario that you um, found problematic was the fact that there are patients with small brain mass, for example, may get no treatment at all. The Medonc figure that they can manage them adequately with just some follow-up imaging. Um, and I think that part, what, part of what drives that is the invisibility of radiosurgery is that most of the world knows little about radiosurgery. Um, yes, we have a bunch of radiosurgery champions on this webinar, but uh, once you leave oncology, once you go even to general physician, among general physicians, much less the general public, I mean, radiosurgery is virtually invisible. And uh, I think it's incumbent on us to make the world of radiosurgery better understood by the public because it may well be that the patient who has that small brain med says, heck, why not get treated down the street at this radio surgery center, which I think is, you know, is, is an effortless, you know, painless procedure. And that is, in fact, part of what we're trying to do with ZAP. So I don't know, that's a, a comment or a question, Doug. You can react to that however you wish. Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, I, I think of, the, you know, the medical oncologists, God bless them, you know, that they run a three ring circus. I mean, they're, they're challenged with every organ system that cancer can spread to. And, you know, they can't have a complete appreciation of, of everything. Now, the excellent ones obviously do. And it's just, as these patients are living longer and longer, we need to show the value of living well. And by, you know, part of the message I'm giving right now is avoiding, you know, that, that, that eight millimeter tumor uh, is a very different one from the one that's 15 millimeters in the motor strip that's now got edema around it, now caused a sensory seizure, a motor seizure, now required an ER visit, hospital admission, CT scan, then an MRI, and, and, and that whole thing could have been avoided. So we need to be stronger with our message that, again, the whole cancer is a chronic disease and not an acute disease by putting the fires out frequently and early. And if someone has 10 procedures, that's less cost effective. That's what that's still much more cost effective than let's say a craniotomy, a whole brain radiation and three radiosurgeries. So I think the, the algorithms and the math are going to get more complex, but again, like we've done before, we need to lead the charge and set them, set the message. Cause if we don't set that message, someone else is going to set a different message. So that's, you know, that's the way that your, your practice has been, my practice, and, and those that have been kind of research leaders in the field, is that we need to preach the gospel that we want to preach here. A reality distortion. So someone posed an interesting question, and, but anyone who's been in the operating room and seen how we throw out 100 pounds of waste with every procedure, uh, the question is, has carbon footprint been considered in these analyses? So I don't know, that's a question for you. Linda for uh, for Doug. Yeah, I saw that question initially. I was wondering, were they talking about the the, uh, the inane publishing of paper? But I think they meant <laughs> meant all the effort regarding uh, uh, hospital costs and and you know uh, uh, petroleum costs and you know whatever is involved. But no, I think they they have not been. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, the reason there's not, a, there's not a lot of articles on this topic to begin with is that it's complex. And adding more complexity is interesting, but not yet done. Well, I mean, I would ask, you know, medical waste is hardly a green industry. Yeah. And it's another way to cast what we do, I think, as being beneficial. 
um, we don't generate a lot of waste. Uh, right. Um, here's a question directly for you, Linda. Uh, says the uh, published uh, radiation oncology APM values have a radiation oncology professional and technical fee component, but I've not seen any mention of neurosurgeon specific value. Will neurosurgeons still be able to build their 617 or 636 codes in addition to the uh, our radiation oncology APM bundle for intracranial treatments? If, if the, if the neurosurgeon is in an, a statistical area that was per, chosen to participate in the model, there will be billing, specific billing codes that he can use to do to bill for his professional time. The radiation oncologist will have his code. They haven't released those codes yet. There's going to be a billing webinar that CMS is having on December 10th to tell us all how to bill this. That's one of the reasons we asked them to move it back to, to July because they haven't given us that yet. But there will be specific separate codes for the, two, the professional for the, both the neurosurgeon and the radiation oncologist and then the technical, which the technical fees were a little bit easier for us to, to get a hand on. But those codes will have to come out. There will be specific codes and that's a small model. Most of you don't have that many patients in your practice that are traditional Medicare insured. Um, at, at, Georgetown, there's, their Medicare is 34%, and we're thinking it's like 1% or 2% of their patients. So it's going to be a small model, so it's not going to be, um, you, know, a, you know, you'll still use the rest of the code, normal codes for the rest of it. Well, I mean, government is government, and, you know, who knows who can figure out sometimes the political deals that result in the rules and regulations we deal with. But the, the private insurance industry, you know, sees to care about money in a way that uh, more so in some respects that the government doesn't. And you see all these interesting, I mean, there's so much ferment or seems to be ferment um, primary care. Um, and even now I hear orthopedics where, uh, where insurers are carving out um, high value specialty care and the um, negotiating sp uh, specifically with providers of that care. And so um, why or will we ever see this for radio surgery? Is radio surgery just a rounding error and uh, on the world of medicine and just no one's paying attention? Or is it possible that we could carve out for the, the Edna's of the world, United Health or the Amazons uh, to pay attention and to help deliver more cost-effective health. Well, I'll, an I'll answer that one first because I can tell you that every CMS webinar that I've been on, all of the ins uh, insurers like Aetna and others have had representatives on that call. They're paying very close attention to this model that's come out. And I think you're right. I think there is an opportunity here for us to carve out a specific payment model with, for those um, private insurers. And the reason being is that as these baby boomers get older and we're seeing more and more radiation therapy and, and, and more intervention where there is an, you know, an improvement in the quality and the, the survival rates, that they're going to want to work with us and say, this is a patient who's going to have a chronic, as Doug was saying, a chronic issue, and we'd like to carve out a way to deal with that. There is huge opportunity there, and I think that will be coming um, to most medical centers probably very soon. Doug? Um, no, no, nothing to add. Okay. Good. I mean, I, I could see our deals being made with uh, big employers and, uh, and back, back to one-time payments, you get all the radio surgery you want for your lifetime, <laughs> setting a breath. Um, and then really that's where the money is. There is no money. I mean, the purpose of, of, of private insurance is to cover all the bills that Medicare and Medicaid don't pay. So here's a question, and Linda, this may be one, you're on both sides of this uh, question. Has anyone compared uh, the cost effectiveness of radio surgery with proton therapy? Uh, yes, and that was addressed um, with even within the uh, radiation oncology model that was just published. They, um, they questioned the effectiveness of, of proton 
uh, for some types of cancer. They have identified the ones that they think it, 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 that makes sense for it, certainly children and some, you know, some other uh, in adults, but they are looking at that. Um, and that's one of the reasons they developed this model is because they were worried that with the proliferation of proton centers that there were going to be more and more um, claims coming in for proton um, simply because they um, needed to fill the systems up with with patients. That's that's they've actually said that in the Federal Register. So um, yes, they're they they are addressing that. And I know a lot of we have a proton center, so you know everybody understands the expense of those types of systems, but Medicare says it's going to be neutral in terms of system that we use, and they're, I think, going to stick to that. So we're going, going to have to do what some of, I, I talked with um, Keith Unger at Georgetown, and they're, they're learning to almost be like a fractionated treatment under Proton. They're doing fewer and fewer treatments under Proton when they were more like 40 to 45. They're, they're narrowing that down because of their experience with CyberKnife and now Zap. So there's some ways to do it, but that's something, the cost of that is going to be something that all centers will have to address. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank both of you, and uh, you guys have been thought leaders in this field as well as others. Uh, it is a reality that um, that sometimes science doesn't drive reimbursement uh, and then clinical practice, but Reimbursement, reimbursement drives clinical practice, and uh, we need people like you continue to, to fight the good fight for all of us. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, this is the last of our webinar series, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And perhaps we'll be meeting in person and not too long in the future if this vaccine works out. If not, you never know, Mark may cook up another webinar series. So, everyone, be well, happy Thanksgiving, and happy holidays. <laughs>